Section 8 of Astounding Stories 12, December 1930 By Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pirate Planet by Charles W. Diffin Part B Chapter 12 Lieutenant McGuire awoke, as he had on other occasions, to the smell of sickly sweet fumes and the stifling pressure of a mask held over his nose and mouth. He struggled to free himself, and the mask was removed. Another of the man-creatures, whom McGuire had not seen before, helped him to sit up. A group of the attenuated figures, with their blood and ashes faces, regarded him curiously. The one who had helped him arise forced the others to stand back, and he gave McGuire a drink of yellow fluid from a crystal goblet. The dazed man gulped it down to feel a following surge of warmth and life that pulsed through his paralyzed body. The figures before him came sharply from the haze that had enveloped them. A window high above admitted a golden light that meant another day, but it brought no cheer or encouragement to the flyer. McGuire felt crushed and hopeless in the knowledge that his life must still go on. If only that sleep could have continued, carried him out to the deeper sleep of death. What hope for them here? Not a chance. And then he remembered Sykes. He mustn't desert Sykes. He looked about him to see the same prison room from which he and Sykes had escaped. The body of the scientist was motionless on the hammock bed across the room. An occasional deep-drawn breath showed that the man still lived. No, he must not leave Sykes, even if he had the means of death. They would fight it through together, and perhaps, perhaps, they might yet be of service, might find some way to avert the catastrophe that threatened their world. Hopeless? Beyond doubt. But he must hope. And fight. The leader had watched the light of understanding as it returned to the flyer's eyes. He motioned now to the others, and McGuire was picked up bodily by four of them and carried from the room. McGuire's mind was alert once more. He was eager to learn what he could of this place that was to be their prison. But he saw little. A glory of blending colors beyond where the golden light from without shone through opal walls. Then he found himself upon a narrow table, where straps of metal were thrown quickly about to bind him fast. He was tied hand and foot to the table that moved forward on smooth rollers to a waiting lift. What next? he questioned. Not death, for they had been too careful to keep him alive, these repulsive things that stared at him with such cold malevolence. Then what? And McGuire found himself with unpleasant recollections of others he had seen strapped in similar fashion to an operating table. The lift that he had thought would rise fell smoothly, instead, to stop at some point far below ground, where the table with its helpless burden was rolled into a great room. He could move his head, and McGuire turned and twisted to look at the maze of instruments that filled the room, a super-laboratory for experiments of which he dared not think. "'Whoever says I'm not scared to death is a liar,' he whispered to himself. But he continued to look and wonder as he was wheeled before a gleaming machine of many coils and shining metal parts. A smooth sheet of metal stood vertically beyond him, painted a grayish-white, he saw, but he could not imagine its use. A throng of people seated in the room turned blood-red faces toward the bound man and the metal sheet. "'Looks as if we were about to put on a show of some kind,' he told himself, "'and I am cast for a leading role.' He watched as best he could from his bound position, while a tall figure in robes of lusterless black appeared to stand beside him. The newcomer regarded him with a face that was devoid of all emotion. McGuire felt the lack of the customary expression of hatred. There was not even that, and he knew he was nothing more than a strange animal, bound and helpless, ready for this weird creature's experiments. The one in black held a pencil, whose tip was a tiny brilliant light. Abruptly the room plunged to darkness, where the only visible thing was this one point of light. Ceaselessly it waved back and forth before his eyes. He followed it in a pattern of strange design. It approached and receded. Again and again the motion was repeated, until McGuire felt himself sinking, sinking, into a passive state of lethargy. His muscles relaxed, his mind was at rest. There seemed nothing in the entire universe of being but the single point of light that drew him on and on, till something whispered from the far reaches of black space. It came to him, an insistent call. It was asking about the earth, his own world. What of earth's armies and their means of defense? Vaguely he sensed the demand, and without conscious volition he responded. He pictured the world he had known. 
How plainly he saw the wide field at Maricopa, and the sweeping flight of a squadron of planes. Yes, yes. How high could they ascend? From one of the planes he saw the world below. The ships were near their ceiling. This was the limit of their climb. And did they fight with gas? What of their deadliness? And again he was seated in a plane, and he was firing tiny bullets from a tiny gun. No, they did not use gas. But on the ground below, what fortifications, what means of defense? McGuire's mind was no longer his own. He could only respond to that invisible questioner, that insistent demand from out of the depths where he was floating. And yet there was something within him that protested, that clamored at his mind and brain. Fortifications. They must know about fortifications, anti-aircraft guns, means for combating aerial attack. Yes, he knew, and he must explain, and the thing within him pounded in the back of his brain to draw him back to himself. He saw a battery of anti-aircraft guns in operation. The guns were firing, shells were bursting in little plumes of smoke high in the air. And that self within him was shouting now, hammering at him. You are seeing it, it told him. It is there before you on the screen. Stop! Stop! And for an instant McGuire had the strange experience of witnessing his own thoughts. Memories, mental records of past experience were flashing through his mind mock battles, and the batteries were firing, and before him on the metal screen there glowed a vivid picture of the same thing. Men were serving the guns with sure swiftness. The bursts were high in the air. In a flash of understanding Lieutenant McGuire knew that he was giving his country's secrets to the enemy. And in that same instant he felt himself swept upward from the depths of that darkness where he had drifted. He was himself again, bound and helpless before an infernal contrivance of these devil creatures. They had read his thoughts. The machine beside him had projected them upon the screen for all to see. A steady clicking might mean their reproduction in motion pictures for later study. He, Lieutenant McGuire, was a traitor against his will. The screen was blank, and the lights of the room came on to show the thin lips that smiled complacently in a cruel and evil face. McGuire glared back into that face, and he tried with all the mental force that he could concentrate to get across to the exultant one the fact that they had not wholly conquered him. This much they had got, but no more. The thin-lipped one had an instrument in his hand, and McGuire felt the prick of a needle plunged into his arm. He tried to move his head and found himself powerless. And now, in the darkness of the room where all lights were again extinguished, the helpless man was fighting the most horrible of battles. And the battleground was within his own mind. He was two selves, and he fought and struggled with all his consciousness to keep those memories from flooding him. With one part of himself he knew what it meant, a sure knowledge given these invaders of what they must prepare to meet. He was betraying his country, the whole of humanity. And that raging, raving self was powerless to check the flow of memory pictures that went endlessly through his mind and out upon the screen beyond. He had no sense of time. He was limp and exhausted with his fruitless struggle when he felt himself released from the bondage of the metal straps and placed again in the hammock in his room, and he could only look wanly and hopelessly after the figure of Professor Sykes, carried by barbarous figures to the same ordeal. Sleep, through the long night, restored both McGuire and his companion to normal strength. The flyer was seated with his head bowed low in his cupped hands. His words seemed wrung from an agony of spirit. "'So that's what they brought us here for,' he said harshly. "'That's why they're keeping us alive.' Professor Sykes walked back and forth in their bare room, while he shook his impotent fists in the air. "'I told them everything,' he exploded. "'Everything. Their astronomical knowledge must be limited. Under this blanket of clouds they can see nothing, and from their ships they could make approximations only.' And I have told them. The earth and its days and seasons, its orbital velocity and motion, its relation to the orbit of this accursed planet. They had documents from the observatory, and I explained them. I corrected their time of firing their big gun on its equatorial position. Oh, there is little I left untold. Damn them! I wish to heaven, said the flyer savagely, that we had known. We would have jumped out of their beastly ship somehow ten thousand feet up, and we would have taken our information with us. Sykes nodded agreement. Well, he asked, how about tomorrow, and the next day, and the next? They will want more facts. They will pump the last drop of information from us. 
Are we going to allow it? McGuire's tone was dry. You know the answer to that as well as I do. We have just two alternatives. Either we get out of here, find some place to hide in, and then find some way to put a crimp in their plans, or we get out of here for good. It's twenty feet, not twenty thousand, from that window to the ground, but I think a head-first dive would do it. Sykes did not reply at once. He seemed to be weighing some problem in his mind. "'I would prefer the water,' he said at last, "'if we can get away and reach the shore, and if there is not a possibility of escape, which I must admit I consider highly improbable, well, we can always swim out as far as we can go, and the result will be certain. This other is so messy.' The man had stopped his ceaseless pacing, and he even managed a cheerful smile at the lieutenant. And remember, it might only cripple us and leave us helpless in their hands. "'Sounds all right to me,' McGuire agreed. And there was a tone of finality in his voice as he added, "'They've made us do that traitor act for the last time, anyway.'" Daylight comes slowly through cloud-filled skies. The window of the room where the fountain sprayed ceaselessly was showing the first hint of gold in the eastern sky. Above was the utter darkness of the cloud-wrapped night, as the two men swung noiselessly out into the grotesque branches of a tree, to make their way into that gloom below. There, under the cover of great leaves, they crouched in silence, while the darkness about them faded, and a sound of subdued whistling noises came to them from the night. A wheel creaked, and in the dim light two figures appeared tugging at a cart upon which was a cage of woven wire. Beyond them, Against the darker background of denser growth, tentacles coiled and twisted above the row of guardian plants that surrounded the house. One of the ghostly forms reached within the cage and brought forth a struggling object that whimpered in fear. The low whine came distinctly to the hidden men. They saw a vague black thing tossed through the air and toward the deadly plants. They heard the swishing of pliant tentacles and the yelping cry of a frightened animal and the cry rose to a shriek that ended with a gulping splash of thick liquid. The giant pod next in line was open. They could see it dimly, and its tentacles were writhing convulsively, hungrily, across the ground. Another animal was taken from the cage and thrown to the waiting serpent forms that closed about and whirled it high in air. Another, and another. The yelps of terror grew faint in the distance as the monsters passed on in their gruesome work and the two men, palpitant with memories of their own experience, were limp and sick with horror. In the growing light they saw more plainly the fleshy, pliant arms that whipped through the air or felt searchingly along the ground. No hope there for bird or beast that passed by in the night, nor for men as they knew too well. But now, as the golden light increased, the arms drew back to form again the tight-wound coils that flattened themselves beside the monstrous pods whose lips were closing. Locked within them were the pools of liquid that could dissolve a living body into food for these vampires of the vegetable world. "'Damnable!' breathed Sykes in a savage whisper. "'Utterly damnable! And this world is peopled with such monsters!' The last deadly arm was tightly coiled when the men stole off through the lush growth that reached even above their heads. McGuire remembered the outlines he had seen from the air, and led the way where, if no better concealment could be found, the ocean waited with promise of rest and release from their inhuman captors. They counted on an hour's start. It would be that long before their jailer would come with their morning meal and give the alarm, and now they went swiftly and silently through the stillness of a strange world. The air that flicked misty wet across their faces was heavy and heady with the perfume of night-blooming plants. Crimson blossoms flung wide their odorous petals, and the first golden light was filtered through tremendous tree growths of pale lavenders and greys to show as unreal colors in the vegetation close about them. They found no guards. The isolation of this island made the land itself their prison, and the men ran at full speed through every open space, knowing as they ran that there was no refuge for them, only the ocean waiting at the last, but their flight was not unobserved. A great bird rose screaming from a tangle of vines. Its heavy, flapping wings flashed red against the pale trees. A pandemonium of shrieking cries echoed its alarm as other birds took flight. The forest about them was in an uproar of harsh cries, and faintly, from far in the rear, came a babble of shrill calls, weird, inhuman, the voices of the men-things of Venus. "'It's all off,' said McGuire sharply. "'They'll be on our trail now.' 
He plunged through where the trees were more open, and Sykes was beside him as they ran with a burst of speed toward a hilltop beyond. They paused, panting, upon the crest. A wide expanse of foliage in delicate shading swept out before them to wave gently in a sea of color under the morning breeze, and beyond was another sea that beckoned with white breakers on a rocky shore. "'The ocean!' gasped Sykes, and pointed a trembling hand toward their goal. "'But I had no idea that suicide was such hard work.' The tall figure of Lieutenant McGuire turned to the shorter, breathless man, and he gripped hard at one of his hands. "'Sykes,' he said, "'I'll never get another chance to say it, but you're one good scout. Come on.' McGuire fought to force his way through jungle growth, while screaming birds marked where they went. The sounds of their pursuers were close behind them when the two tore their way through the last snarled tangle of pale vine to stand on a sheer bluff, where below deep waters crashed against a rocky wall. They staggered with weariness and gulped sobbingly of the morning air. McGuire could have sworn he was exhausted beyond any further effort, yet from somewhere he summoned energy to spring savagely upon a tall blood-red figure whose purpling face rose suddenly to confront them. One hand closed upon the metal tube that the other hand raised, and with his final reserve of strength, the flyer wrapped an arm about the tall body and rushed it stumblingly toward the cliff. To be balked now, to be brought back to that intolerable prison and the unthinkable role of traitor, the khaki-clad figure wrenched furiously at the deadly tube as they struggled and swayed on the edge of the cliff. He freed his arm quickly, and regardless of the clawing thing that tore at his face and eyes, he launched one long swing for the horrible face above him. He saw the awkward fall of a lean body, and he swayed helplessly out to follow when the grip of Sykes' hand pulled him back and up to momentary safety. McGuire's mind held only the desire to kill, and he would have begun a staggering rush toward the shrieking mob that broke from the cover behind them had not Sykes held him fast. At sight of the weapon, their own gas projector still clutched in the flyer's hand, the pursuers halted their long arms pointed and their shrill calls joined in a chorus that quavered and fell uncertainly. One, braver than the rest, dashed forward and discharged his weapon. The spurting gas failed to reach its intended victims. It blew gently back toward the others, who fled quickly to either side. Above the trees a giant ship nosed swiftly down, and McGuire pointed to it grimly and in silence. The men before them were massed now for a rush. This is the end, said the flyer softly. I wonder how this devilish thing works. There's a trigger here. I will give them a shot with the wind helping. Then we'll jump for it. The ship was above them as the slim figure of Lieutenant McGuire threw itself a score of paces toward the waiting group. From the metal tube there shot a stream of pale vapor that swept downward upon the others who ran in panic from its touch. Then back, in a grip of a hand, and two earthmen, who threw themselves out and downward from a sheer rock wall to the cool embrace of deep water. They came to the top, battered from their fall, but able to dive under a wave and emerge again near one another. "'Swim!' urged Sykes. "'Swim out! They may get us here, recover our bodies, resuscitate us, and that wouldn't do.' Another wave, and the two men were swimming beyond it, swimming feebly but steadily out from shore while above them a great cylinder of shining metal swept past in a circling flight. They kept on while their eyes from the wave-tops saw it turn and come slowly back in a long, smooth descent. It was a hundred feet above the water a short way out at sea, and the two men made feeble motions with arms and legs, while their eyes exchanged glances of dismay. A door had opened in the round undersurface, and a figure whose gas suit made it a bloated caricature of a man was lowered from beneath in a sling. From the stern of the ship gaseous vapor belched downward to spread upon the surface of the water. The wind was bringing the misty cloud toward them. "'The gas!' said McGuire despairingly. "'It will knock us out, and then that devil will get us. They'll take us back. Our last chance. Gone!' "'God help us,' said Sykes weakly. "'We can't even die!' His feeble strokes stopped, and he sank beneath the water. McGuire's last picture, as he too sank, and the waters closed over his head, was the shining ship hovering beyond. He wondered only vaguely at the sudden whirling of water around him. A solid something was rising beneath his dragging feet. 
a firm, solid support that raised him again to the surface. He realized dimly the air about him, the sodden form of Professor Sykes some few feet distant. His numbed brain was trying to comprehend what else the eyes beheld. A metal surface beneath them rose higher, shining wet, above the water. A metal tube raised suddenly from its shield to swing in quick aim upon the enemy ship approaching from above. His eyes moved to the ship, and to the man-thing below in the sling. Its clothes were a mass of flame, and the figure itself was falling headlong through the air. Above the blazing body was the metal of the ship itself, and it sagged and melted to a liquid fire that poured, splashing and hissing, to the waters beneath. In the wild panic the great shape threw itself into the air. It swept out and up in curving flight to plunge headlong into the depths. The gas was drifting close, as McGuire saw an opening in the structure beside him. The voice of a man, human, kindly, befriending, said something of hurry and gas, and lift them carefully but make haste. The white faces of men were blurred and indistinct as McGuire felt himself lowered into a cool room and laid with the unconscious form of Sykes upon a floor. He tried to remember. He had gone down in the water. Sykes had drowned, and he himself, he was tired. Tired. And this, the thought seemed a certainty in his mind, this is death. How very peculiar! He was trying to twist his lips to a weak laugh as the lighted ports in the wall beside him changed from gold to green, then black, and a rushing of torn waters was in his ears. End of Part B Chapter 12 To be continued